Okay, great. Yeah, so welcome back everyone to Four Methods for Software Engineering. Um, last time we looked at uh, first order logic and then we, we saw that first order logic is great and uh, we extended it with certain theories because we want to reuse some things that we know about uh, maybe some part of the world and we want to reuse that in multiple problems that we solve. So for example, arithmetic or equality that are things that we might want to be true for many of the problems we are formulating in first order logic. So that's why we can formulate arithmetic equality in theories, which is basically some set of axioms. So some properties that certain functions will have and some, some values that will exist. Um, and then we can look at satisfiability of those kind of problems. And we said for satisfiability, we always need some kind of model. And this model is basically a set of values that we interpret our um, formulas over, our first order logic formulas over, and uh, some um, mappings of the variables to specific values and of the functions to specific interpretations in those values, um, in this universe of values. And then we said, well, now let's look at satisfiability. And then we said, well, satisfiability is again, if there is some model uh, that makes the formula true with respect to this theory. And we can usually use a bunch of theories. So we saw theories, they are just axioms and we can just put a conjunction between them. And then we have many theories bundled in one. So usually if we want um, maybe arithmetic and equality, which makes a lot of sense, then this theory will be basically multiple theories combined. Um, okay, that was satisfiability. And then of course we have validity again, the same if for all models, um, this would evaluate to true. So now that we have basically the same established as we had for proposition logic, the satisfiability and, um, yeah, satisfiability and validity, we could now use this new logic and express problems in this new logic and then hopefully solve it automatically. Now, um, this automatic solving has some problem. So there is this thing called undecidability in computer science, mathematics, computer science. Um, and it basically means that there is no computer or no program or no computer that can, for all instances of the problem, decide whether uh, it's true or false. So usually we have some problem uh, that is either true or false. We want to know whether maybe some formula is satisfiable or whether maybe some program holds on all possible inputs. So, and then um, this, well, theorem, the halting problem, theorem of undecidability of the halting problem basically says there is no program that could take an arbitrary program for all inputs decide whether, or for a given input even, decide whether this program terminates or not. So now if you look at some program and for example, it says while true, do something. And there's no break, no continue, no return in the body of the loop. You can look at this and say, well, this program will never terminate because there is an infinite loop, right? Um, <clears throat> and there are many things that you can prove by hand on paper probably you did in some math classes, but usually you are proving things in logics that are undecidable. So first order logics, many of them, many instances of those, they are undecidable. Uh, there are some very restricted first order logics which are then decidable, but in most cases they're not. Which means there couldn't be any program checking our satisfiability or checking our validity, which kind of is bad news, right? Because for the proposition logic, we knew there are such solvers. They can solve our problems. They can check satisfiability, they can check validity. But now for first order logic, this is one part of these undecidable problems where there is no program that can do it. Um, yeah, what does this mean? Are we done with this class? Because everything later will be kind of extensions of first order logic or even different kinds of logic. Um, so do we stop using tools now? Back to pen and paper. Um, so first, did anybody ever hear about this undecidability and the halting problem? So it's like a very famous uh, problem of the limits of computability. 
so that the computers that we have today uh, or that we will, well, everything that conforms to our current definition of computation has this inherent limitation that there will always be undecidable problems. Um, and here is, is like a really, really brief intuition of the proof. Uh, and the proof is by contradiction. Um, so you assume that a program exists that can prove or that can decide termination for some input X. So X could be some program. We give this program to our terminates method and this method will return true if the program terminates and false if it doesn't. Um, now, very intuitively, very, very simplified, you could now create a program um, that is defined as if this program that we're currently creating terminates, then we loop forever. So now what happens if this program terminates, you, you basically get a contradiction because either if this thing says, yes, the program P terminates, then this program says, well, then I'm going to run forever and I never terminate. Um, and if this program says, well, it doesn't terminate, then it doesn't go into this loop forever and it terminates. So this is um, kind of the very, very high level idea. Um, if you look into the proof, you see that this is a bit more complicated because here what we have is kind of cheating or oversimplifying because we basically have a self-reference here. We define something that we already use here. So the, the actual proof works along similar lines, but it's a bit more involved by having some extra steps to actually do this kind of self-reference here. Okay, so basically there is this thing undecidability and there's no way around it, not with anything we know about computers today. Um, yeah, pretty bad news. Um, <clears throat> but what we can do is there can be fragments of theories. So fragments, uh, they can be some, for example, syntactically restricted subset of theories. Um, for example, the quantifier free fragment of some theory is a fragment of the normal first order logic uh, of that theory in first order logic because, well, we remove quantifiers. So you can do everything, but never put quantifiers. Um, and usually there are decidable fragments for these undecidable theories. And that's what we're trying to exploit. The tricky bit is that these fragments are often not so easy to find. Or for example, here, let's say uh, we remove all the quantifiers and then we just try to solve the theory without um, quantifiers, this is maybe too limiting. Maybe we want some kind of quantifiers. Um, and then people have looked at in which way can we maybe nest quantifiers? Can we use a single quantifier? Can we use two nested quantifiers? Is it fine if we only use existential quantifiers? Stuff like that. Um, so there's there are many research groups that actually look at this. How can we extend the problems that we can solve? And they, they come up with new um, sometimes heuristics. So the, basically the computer takes a lucky guess, tried something that is maybe uh, successful on many formulas that we've seen before, um, and then tries to solve this. So um, usually we won't get much in touch with this kind of stuff, but the way that we will get in touch with this is um, it can happen that the solver that we're going to use says unknown. And if it says unknown, then um, we know it probably ran into some problem where it found out, well, it's either taking too much time to search for a solution um, or it's yeah really not guaranteed that there is a solution. So if it says unknown, we have usually a case of this undecidable problem. Um, so that might happen. You might feed your the next tool that we're going to use, you might feed it with stuff and it says, I don't know. Um, and yeah, this is usually from version to version. People try to uh, remove some of the unknowns. They try to solve more and more formulas. Um, and, and there's also some lots of research on this. Um, but we know that we will never be able to solve all of the formulas. So that's for sure based on the undecidability of the first order logics that we're dealing with. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. So now let's look at the tool. The new tool is called SMT solvers. Uh, well, SMT, satisfiability modulo theories, because now we have this bunch of theories that we're going to use. Um, and yeah, we want to basically determine this satisfiability problem. So um, if the formula F was simply a propositional formula, so we only have these Boolean variables, then it's some truth assignment to Boolean variables. But if it's a first order logic formula, then it needs to be uh, yeah, something that assigns values to all variables and also gives interpretations of all the functions. So now this is very different from, um, let's say, the propositional logic where we just had basically assignments to the variables. So we, we assign true or false to each, each variable. Uh, we could easily extend this and, and to arithmetic and maybe assign true and false to, um, uh, sorry, and, and assign maybe numbers to variables, right? To integer variables. Uh, but then here we also have to interpret the functions and predicates. So we have to give meaning to them. Some of them will be determined by the theory. So for example, the equality predicate that's usually determined by our theory of equality. But other predicates that we introduce, they might not be determined uh, fully by uh, the theories. And then the solver basically has to come up with a description of how does this predicate work? When does it evaluate to true? When does it evaluate to false? And yeah, the difference here, set solvers, we know them. They check only for validity and satisfiability of propositional formulas. And SMT solvers, they check for satisfiability in some decidable first order theory, or let's say some, some fragment where we know that there are many uh, decidable um, parts lying around. So linear arithmetic, uninterpreted functions, we will see what those are, array theory, bit vectors. So stuff like array theory and bit vectors, they will become very important when we reason about um, memory models and heap of programs, but we're not going to go that far into the detail. But you can imagine that when you want to reason about um, the correctness of programs or the correctness of your operating system, then you need to look at how are things actually represented in bit vectors rather than in integers, because the integers uh, that we have in the normal theory, they don't have this limit to, let's say, 32-bit. So if you have limits of machines, then you usually want to use bit vectors because then everything is some register or, or some bounded variable. Um, and we will see that the integers that we have in the SMT solver, they're actually not limited to some bit number. Um, so that's why they might behave slightly different. For example, um, with the normal integers we have in the SMT solver, you would never have an overflow or underflow because this thing simply keeps on counting. Whereas with bit vectors, of course, you can have overflows and underflows. Okay, but um, we will only look a little bit at this area of program verification as one of the applications, and we will not go very deeply into program verification. So yeah, what do we have to do? Usually we have to say what kind of variables we want to use in our first order uh, logic formula. So this could be Booleans, integers. This could also be some custom data types that we can define ourselves. That's possible. Um, then we want to say what are the conditions that these variables must satisfy. So uh, the kind of constraints that we had also in um, the SAT solvers, but now they can be, of course, a bit richer and use those functions and, and predicates. And then uh, we also usually want to introduce the facts about the world. So the stuff that is not just depending on our constraints, but kind of uh, should be known to the solver um, because we have to come up with an encoding of our problem. So we, we kind of did this, uh, the constraints and the facts about the world slightly implicitly when we were encoding things. Um, so in the... Yeah, in the feature models, I would say that you have like those facts in the world. They are the way that the features are combined based on, well, each feature, if you include it, it has to include its parent. Um, things like this, these are like facts about the world that you're trying to model because the SMT solver has no clue that you're, I don't know, modeling feature models or, or something else. So you have to tell the SMT solver what you're doing and what you want to 
uh, hold over the variables that you introduced. And then the SMT solver will try to find a solution or a, and the solution now will be a model that satisfies your um, constraints and your conditions. For that, the basic theory is that we have a SAT solver, a bunch of theory solvers, and this gives us our SMT solver. So it is a lot based on what we know from SAT solving, although we didn't really go deep into the details of SAT solving. But here, let's look at an example. So this is, again, very much a simplification, but this kind of tells us how they might work under the hood. Um, so let's say we have this first order logic formula. We have variables. These variables likely are integers, right? We have y greater than 2 and, or y less than 1. Um, and then we have equality here. So this means that we already probably have some theories involved of, of integers, of arithmetic, because we have addition here. So, um, but we also have some kind of a list of these things. So now, usually a list of elements, a list of constraints means that we want to satisfy all the constraints in the list. So that's why we would write them as a conjunction. So we want to satisfy x is greater or equal to 0, and y equals x plus 1, and y greater than 2, or y less than 1. So this is how to read this list of constraints or list of assertions. And we can extract basically some Boolean expressions from these. We could say, well, x greater than 0, um, and this, and this, or these two. Let's just split it everywhere. We have those traditional Boolean connectives. So here we have an or, right? Here we have ends. So let's just extract x greater or equal to 0 as p1. Let's say this thing here, that's p2. And then y greater than 2, that's p3, right? They don't uh, reoccur. So if we would have, of course, y greater than 2 here and there, it will make a lot of sense to use p3 again, right? So we want, we want to know what are possible solutions to the problems here. Um, so this would be the naming that we extract. And then now we suddenly have a propositional logic problem that we can try to solve with a SAT solver. So here, I mean, just looking at this makes it really easy. We know this must be true, this must be true, and then one of those must be true, right? So uh, not very complicated. So let's say the SAT solver generates one assignment. Now we have a concrete interpretation of these things, and we can try to put them back here. So we say, to make this overall formula true, we need to make sure that p1 is true, p2 is true, p3 is false, and p4 is true. Now, how do we ensure that? This means that these statements here have to be true or false in the theory. But now we are, we basically got rid of all of these um, operators of all of the Boolean operators. Now we're only left with stuff that is expressed in the theory. So now the stuff is only on the level of our theory. We have uh, something that only deals with numbers and, well, comparisons between numbers and also operators between numbers, but no more, uh, well, except for this one, no more real Boolean um, connectives here. So then the theory solver now is optimized for solving this kind of stuff that doesn't have any um, Boolean operators, but only has the stuff available to it in the theory. So this one, the theory solver, is maybe optimized for integer stuff. And it will try to figure out um, whether it can give a solution that satisfies all these constraints. Can it? Can we find some interpretation, some assignment to variable x and y that makes this True? No? Why not? Because at the same time, it's less than 1 and greater than 2. Yeah, so here uh, we have uh, basically this negation is uh, 2 is greater or equal to y. And then here we have y is less than 1, so that doesn't work. Now it needs to give us some 
subset that it tells us is unsatisfiable. And um, it gives us, well, some constraints here. And then based on what the theory solver determined as unsatisfiable, together we can propagate this information back. Now we have a basically a theory conflict because this thing was unsatisfiable. This is what the theory solver said was unsatisfiable together. We um, say now that this is our theory conflict that we extracted based on the knowledge of the theory solver. So this we can propagate back to our SAT solver and tell the SAT solver, give us a new assignment that avoids this kind of conflict. Now, um, the tricky bit is here, we're basically well, how many solutions are we ruling out by identifying this uh, conflict here? Are we ruling out a single solution? Now, there are many, many ways to get to this conflict, right? Uh, there are many ways to satisfy this formula and basically run into this conflict. So the tricky bit is always when you found a conflict, how do you extend this conflict to ruling out all the similar conflicts as well? So by ruling out many similar conflicts on the Boolean level, this actually helps the SAT solver to not suggest similar uh, conflicting formulas. If we would rule out a single assignment, then we ask the sub solver again to give us an assignment, it might give us a very, very similar conflict. So the strength of good theory solvers is that we can extrapolate from the conflicts that they find and rule out multiple uh, solutions on the proposition logic level so that we can then have a smaller search space for what is left to cover and what is left to the other candidate solutions that we have to check with our theory solver again. Okay, so the tool that we're going to use is called Z3. And um, we also have made this available online in uh, the same platform that you saw before. Now, the tricky bit is that Z3 uses something called, well, it, it uses the a standard. So Z3 is not the only SMT solver. There are many SMT solvers. And people decided to make those SMT solvers comparable. We need a certain input standard that is easy for every tool to support. And they decided for the SMT lib2 standard. So now it's SMT lib, it's basically now in, in version two. Um, and it uses a prefix notation or also called, I think, Polish notation. Uh, did anybody ever come across this prefix notation? So usually you have infix notation where the operator is written in between the operands, right? So if you have X plus Y, then it's infix because the operator is written between the two operands. If you use the Polish notation or prefix notation, you would have to write plus x, y, which would mean x plus y. So this is slightly confusing. Um, so now if we look at propositional logic again, now we saw that there are some differences to uh, what we're used to, right? Uh, so let me make this a bit larger. Um, first, now this is all Boolean variables, but these variables now live in a first order logic because Z3 is a first order logic solver. So this means that we have to tell uh, what are the elements of the first order logic. For example, we have Boolean variables. So now um, you remember that we can declare functions and predicates, and there are some functions which have zero parameters or arity zero. And then those functions are constants. So there's like a short hand here to define functions with zero parameters. And that thing is called uh, declare const. So we have to declare a constant P of type Boolean. OK, 
Q of type Boolean and R of type Boolean. If we wouldn't declare those constants, it would not be able to interpret this formula because now P, Q, R, they could be all kinds of um, types. They could be even functions themselves, right? So we have to tell it, well, these are special functions of arity zero, so these are constants. And then it knows, well, if they're constants, then I just need to give them uh, values. Okay, so now what is the formula that we wrote here? We declare again some function. Now this is slightly different here. It was just constants here. It's de declare a function. This has a name. This has a list of parameters. Now our uh, list of parameters is also empty. And then it has a return value Boolean. And then it has the function body, how this function evaluates. So this is how you would declare a function. Now. It happens to be that this function is basically some evaluation over the variables that we declared. And then um, we can have assertions. For example, we can assert that um, this conjecture does not hold. This conjecture is our function. So basically, we assert that our uh, function returns false by saying not conjecture, this means that this function must evaluate to false to make this assertion true. OK, so what we will usually write are these declarations for all the elements we want to use, variables and functions and predicates. And then we will write a bunch of asserts that encode the constraints that we want uh, a solution for. So um, let's say we wouldn't have this assert. And then uh, we ask for a solution. How do we ask for a solution? We, we have um, now, this is like a, a script. So in Limbool, when we were running Limbool, we would simply, well, all we would say here in this top menu, uh, we would say, well, we want you to check validity or we want you to check satisfiability, right? Now, smtlib is slightly different. So smtlib, we need to say inside the kind of script or inside our formula, what we want the tool to do. We want to say, check for satisfiability. So now it says, yeah, this thing is satisfiable. And now if we want to tell it, well, also actually give us um, the model, then we have to write get model. And then it's like a, a script that is executed with uh, the get model. So let's see. Okay, now we have a model. Um, this is a model because, well, we said a model gives a uh, kind of universe of values. Now, this is very uh, simple here. This universe is the, the constants true and false. Um, and then we said that the model also gives interpretations or assignments to all the variables. Now, and uh, yeah, interpretations for all the functions. Now, this declare const that we had up here is just a shorthand for a function with t zero. So it looks slightly strange that booleans are represented as functions with no parameters that simply return a constant. That's because, yeah, it's very um, general solution. So here we see, well, R would be false. Q would be false. P would be false. And it's just a bit of a strange syntax because we can deal with uh, very complicated stuff like uh, complex functions. So here it says, well, I also give you an interpretation or an assignment for this function conjecture. And that's because that's, this is just a function. It looks like, yeah, basically like we defined it. Um, now, what is this thing actually checking right now? We have some variables or well yeah variables then we have some function here and then we are checking for satisfiability now this function is never applied to anything because we commented out this assert um now it just gives some satisfying assignment to the variables basically now 
we're, we're not asserting anything. So it can do anything to the variables, whatever it wants. We could make the variables true. We could make them false, arbitrary values. Um, it just gives us one solution. So now if we comment, if we put this back in, the assert, not conjecture, then it actually has to do some work. Because then it says, well, now I have to make the negation of conjecture true. So let's see if it can do that. Um, it can't. It says the check sat. Now, so now this this output you might get this a few times. Um, it's probably useful to read this output. So here we have this uh, check sat. If we only had the check sat, we would only get this unsat output because all we asked is check satisfiability. It says, well, yeah, it's unsat. I checked it for you. It's not satisfiable. Um, if we put back the get model, it says, well, uh, I can't give you the model. There's an error here because the model is not available. The model is not available because this thing was unsat, right? So if if it's unsat, it means there's no model. No model exists. Okay. So uh, I wonder, can we delete this? Negation. Ah. What invalid? Okay, so um, yeah, you have to be a bit careful. You can't put parentheses the way you like. Uh, for example, if you have a single function call, then you can't put parentheses around it. So um, this is now correct. Um, so now we're asserting that the conjecture holds. And then it finds us some assignment. It's also false, but now it finds a model. So um, what actually is this formula? Can somebody explain what is uh, expressed in this formula here? Like we, we are using the polished notation. Yes, right? exactly, yeah. We can convert it to the normal notation. Yeah, so let's, let's convert it to the normal notation so that we kind of get a feeling for, uh, yeah. P like P, it is actually P like that. Okay, so wait, P uh, in, Lies Q. So I'll, I'll write end. Uh, then Q implies R and R. Okay, and because this is uh, end is stronger than implication, we have to put parentheses. So where? Sorry. Again. Why again? <laughs> So we, which implication now? Uh, we, we need another implication. Yeah. And then uh, we have P implies R. So now, uh, where do all of these come from, right? Um, <laughs> now, maybe let's look at the kind of the innermost ones. So this implies is between P and R. So P implies R. Now, this thing basically moved down here. Uh, then this thing is P implies Q. That's this term. And this right here is the one that is written right after it. But if you look what function is actually applied to this, uh, or what operator is actually implied, applied to those two, so this, uh, well, Q, implies R, that's this one. And then you see they're both uh, parameters of this end. So if we write it in infix again, then it's basically this end. We write it between the two uh, parameters. So this would be uh, that thing. And then we see, well, there's actually one more um, operator here. That's the implies. So the left side of the implies we already have. Then we have the implies, and then we need the right side of the implies, which is the kind of second parameter of that implies. And that's basically this guy over here. So now we've sorted this back into the infix notation that we're all familiar with. Um, this takes a bit of time to get used to. 
and we will have a lot more examples. And, and this is this prefix notation. This will be for all of the functions and operators here. So even the ones that we define ourselves, if they would have parameters, we would have to use them in this uh, prefix notation. OK. Um, yeah. So now, uh, and what were we checking here? So we have P implies Q and Q implies R. This implies that uh, P implies R. Anybody recognize this? Some kind of transitivity, right? So if, if one implies, if P implies Q and Q also implies R, then the first one also implies the last one. And what are we doing with this negation here? If we negate some formula that we, and then check satisfiability of that formula, and it's unsat. What does it mean? So now we're basically back on the level of propositional logic, right? Um, if we negate the formula and it's unsat, it means the formula itself was valid. So uh, this conjecture here is valid because this negation is unsat. Uh, so we basically just proved uh, this transitivity. OK, good. Um, yeah, that's the um, simple stuff that we already knew and that we could already do with SAT solvers. Now it's just, yeah, it looks much more complicated, right? We could have plucked the same thing into Limbool, only this part written in infix, and it would have been much easier, right? So uh, let's look at a bit more complicated stuff. Um, ah, this, yeah, one, one thing that also is quite important. So here we have um even a more simple formula we just have one variable and we want to know what what's this formula a and not a yeah so we were basically trying to check can we have an assignment a model for uh this first logic formula a and not a can somebody give me a model So a model would give assignments to variables. We only have one variable. So how many possible ways are there to assign a Boolean variable A? Two. And uh, how many of them would make this formula true? So if it's in an assert and we check satisfiability, it means this thing, we must make it true. Can we make it true? No, so what should we expect? We would expect that this thing says unsat, and then it says error, no model exists, right? Um, it doesn't do that. It says sat. And it gives us an example, an assignment A. Huh. Can somebody explain? Is this a model? It doesn't, I mean, it's, well, there's only this one function, right? The A, it's only a constant. So, okay, so uh, I'll tell you because um, this is a very important lesson. Uh, the exclamation mark is not the negation in SMTlib. Uh, we would actually have to write not as the negation. Um, and then it says unsat, and we can't extract the model. So this is really, really tricky because in Limbool and in Java and in, I don't know, probably well, Python, everywhere, mainly the exclamation mark is negation. In SMTlib, the exclamation mark is some kind of formal annotation. So it's some kind of uh, annotation to reference elements in your formula. So it, it has only some kind of syntactic meaning that is not interpreted when we use the formula. So basically what we had written here is A and A. And we can make A and A true by setting A true, right? So um, yeah, 
if you want negation, use the not. <laughs> okay, and also the implication, um, I think in Limbu, was it not the minus and then greater? So here it's the equal and then greater as the implication. So yeah, also that's uh, yeah a bit unfortunate that these different tools have different syntax for operators, but yeah, that's that's the way it is. So yeah, that's negation. Now let's look at arithmetic. Now um, something more great more pays off to have something beyond a subsolver. So let's have some integer variables, some real value variables, and then let's combine them into some formulas. So this first formula, what does it uh, require here? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, A is less than B plus two. It's yeah. So this uh, the order of course is is very important. Uh, the A is on the left side of the less than uh, if we write it in infix notation. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next one here would assert well equality A equals two times C plus 10, right? Yeah, <laughs> so this would be an infix. So it's, uh, yeah, quite, and here you simply have equality between D and E. Here we have uh, C plus B equals 1000, right? So now let's ask for our model. And now we get um, our model. So now again, the interpretation of these, well, what we defined as declare const are actually functions of arity zero. So it says here D would be zero. Um, and we said here D needs to be equal to E. So E also needs to be zero. And then uh, A and, and B are these numbers. And you can probably, yeah, validate here that this really makes sense. So if we add C and D, so uh, where's C, 330 and, uh, ah, sorry, it was B, C and B. So C and B plus 670, this gives us the 1000 um, right here. Okay, great. So we can also do arithmetic. Now the, well, important syntax here is again, the prefix notation. And then the declare const, we always need to give the name and then the type, because now our variables could have multiple types and there are different types. You can look up in this, uh, these links that I put on the slides. Um, what kind of stuff is supported for the theory of arithmetic? So you see that some of these examples here, this was actually an example from this uh, overview of the different, um, yeah of the different uh, things that we can have. So there are some simple subsets of arithmetic, for example, this difference arithmetic, um, but then it gets more complex also with nonlinear arithmetic where you then have multiplication in there as well. And um, you can also have division. Division actually is, yeah, very funny. Um, you have different kind of forms of division. So uh, we didn't have division in this one, right? Um, maybe we'll look at division a bit later. So um, actually it interprets the division as a function and then it gives us also an interpretation of that function. Um, yeah. Um, oh, and yeah, one thing here, it says division by zero is allowed, but it has an unspecified result. I'm not sure why that is, maybe because uh, having some undefined as part of numbers is, is a bit tricky to model. Um, so yeah, um, here's some example where they divide by zero and uh, <clears throat> here, if you, well, let's copy this.
if you try to analyze this, uh, then we see that the first one here, we divide A by, let's, let's only do the first one. Um, one. So we basically take some variable A, we divide it by zero, and we say that this equals 10. Let's see if that works. Yes, that works. A could be 38. Um, and then the division function, we could define it simply as returning 10. No matter what we divide, this is some interpretation. And this interpretation is valid because there was nothing defined for division by zero, right? So we, we could be anything. So let's say our division function just says, well, whatever we divide, it's 10. Um, sounds a bit strange, but uh, because we divide by zero, that's fine. Now let's maybe divide by, uh, I don't know, two. And well, now um, uh, it doesn't define the division function here. OK, so uh, yeah, in this case, we wouldn't get this division function defined. I'm not sure why not, but uh, it will exist. And it says uh, that the function a would be, well, 20. And of course, 20 divided by 2 equals 10, right? No, no problem. Now let's divide it again by 0. And now let's add another assertion where uh, we also say if we divide a by 0, it's 2. Uh, let's, or maybe let's just only, yeah, let's, let's do those two and then also check satisfiability again. Um, now the second time it says unsat, if we would comment out the first one, um, then it would say it's satisfiable. So one time we divide a by zero, we get two. The other time we divide a by zero, we get 10. And it says that's both times a correct division because it's simply not defined what division by zero should be. Uh, but what is defined that we can't uh, divide a, uh, well, the same number twice and get different uh, results, right? So we need to have the same results when we uh, apply the same function to the same numbers. Okay, so that's arithmetic. Uh, and now let's have uh, yeah a quick, uh, no, I shouldn't be the one clicking here. I should click, uh, I should click here. So, oh, right. This is question one, but we're actually already at, um, Hmm. Doesn't look like it's the right question. Valid formulas, correct statements. Ah, I guess this one. Yeah, so um, just a quick multiple choice check on your understanding of this special notation. Do we want to assume anything about A and C? Should we assume that they're integers? So let's... Uh...
declare const a int and declare const c int um and then we had this assert now we can check such and get model so this is one possible assignment right uh, c equals one and is it one or is it all uh, so what does this look like in infix notation in infix notation it says a equals 2c plus 10 right so um, <clears throat> this means that if a is 10 it's fine if c is zero so that's one possible uh, assignment there might be more and um, now let's have a look what does it mean about uh, here about this is a greater than 2c so how can we check this for sure i mean we can look at it uh, and decide but we could also simply encode it here right so uh, how do we encode this that a is greater than 2c we need an assertion then we need probably a greater a and then the second is uh the 2c right um okay now we can check that this is satisfiable right but uh how do we actually check that this is uh always the case for all assignments So yeah, where do we put the not? In front of this one, right? Because this is the one that we want as like the the base assertion. And then the thing that we want to check whether it always holds is only the second assert, right? So the second assert, we need to put a not around it. And then we're expecting that this is answered. Yes, exactly. So now we know this thing always holds. Great. Um, the next one to see equals, well, that doesn't really make sense. Um, and then this one here, 10 equals a plus 2c. So we check this as well. Nobody really, well, some people like this, right? Half of the ones who pick, right? Does it mean half? Well, could be independent, but let's check this as well, right? Uh, so this one was saying, ah, uh, no, I pulled this tab out well never mind um let's leave it here so where are we here so now that we kind of yeah confirm this one how do we check this other one we can do the validity right ah uh, thought i copied this better okay um so we can leave the negation in there because we want to check again validity, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's now, yeah. Equals, yeah, let's start with equals. And then the left is the 10. And then uh, here we have some, plus a and then probably we need a uh, yeah another closing parenthesis okay it says it's sat so the negation is sat and it gives us an example so now this means that it was not true right it was not valid so uh, uh yeah so you shouldn't have picked this one <laughs> and um now, what, well, how do we read this 1 and 12? Let's put this 1 and 12 in our original assertion, right? Our original assertion was here that um, A is now 12, right? 12 equals 2 times 1 plus 10. Great. It's satisfied, right? Yeah. Actually, so what signifies that A can only it's not written here that A can only be positive. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, there are multiple. Yeah, yeah. It could be like we could, uh, if this was two, then this would have to be 14, right? Uh, because, well, yeah. Um, A is simply determined by C, fully determined by C. If we change C, we're changing our A. Yeah, and it's there's, that's the only constraint, basically. But now, this thing here um, was, so we know that this one is satisfied by this assignment, right? And then this, what we said down here, uh, is not. Our, um, our example model now actually shows us a way to satisfy this and violate this. So let's try to plug in the numbers. Um, 10 equals, well, 12 plus 2. Not really, right? So C was 1, right? So this is 2. So 12 plus 2 does not equal 10. That's 14. So um, now our check, our validity check, even gives us an explanation why this thing is not um, correct by giving us some assignment that makes it false. OK. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Then functions. We can have uninterpreted functions. So this is quite popular when you solve uh, yeah, complex, when you have complex relations between elements. So here we would have a simple function over integers. So this function f would take an integer and return an integer. Now, what do we know about this function? Um, well, we have well, A is uh, less than 20, B is less than A, and then F of 10 is 1. So actually, this is not related to A and B, but let's um, still look at some interpretation here. So uh, yeah, we can even skip these. Uh, or we could say, uh, can we say F of A equals B? Or let's say mm, do I have enough parentheses? Yeah, let's do it a bit more tricky. Um, yeah, so now we have well a less than 20, that's our 19. Then b it says one, and then we have this interpretation of this function. We gave this function without a body. So if you Remember in the uh, in this one here, we defined a function and we said how to evaluate this function, right? We gave a function definition, but now it's an uninterpreted function because we didn't give it a definition. We just say, well, this is some function and we don't know exactly how it's computed, but we know certain properties about this function. We know that this function applied to 10 equals one. And we know that this, oh, and we know that this function applied to A gives us B. So now it says, well, let's define a function that does this. And this function is always returning 1. So that's how you read this function definition. So it comes up with functions that solve all the constraints uh, that we have for defined in our model. OK. Um, so here, then, of course, if we say uh, that this is, I don't know, greater than one. It needs to change the interpretation of the function, right? And if we say that, I don't know, this is also, let's see, does this work? If we say it's also greater than B, then it also has to change something in the model. Uh, it could, well, yeah, uh, sorry, B was greater than that function. So it could, of course, change B and then leave the function the same way. OK, so um, this means that the models that we can now get as solutions to our problems are much richer. They can do much more stuff, like, for example, finding functions for us that give us some certain properties. OK, now um, what about quantifiers? Oh, there's not a link. Oh. Um, <laughs> where are the slides? Oh, 
Okay. Does anybody know this? Uh, this, uh, let's say, fundamental law of drinking in a pub. Uh, so there's like this. <clears throat> uh, yeah, fundamental law that there is someone in the pub such that if they are drinking, everyone in the pub is drinking, right? Uh, and that's true in every pub. And we can formulate this with, well, yeah, we can formulate this with quantifiers. So there exists some person X and we have a predicate about this person X is drinking. So person X is drinking implies that for all Y, they're also drinking, right? Uh, has anybody ever been to a pub? That how it works? No. Okay, let's formulate this in SMT because now we have quantifiers. Uh, but yeah, let's let's formulate it uh, slightly different. Uh, so because we have another thing, let's say we have data types. So let's have a data type guests, and let's say there are only five guests there. We could extend it to six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Doesn't matter. We can just add more guests, right? Uh, so this is our declaration of this problem. So we have guests. This data type has these uh, possible values, A, B, C, D, E. Um, that's okay. Let's, let's maybe assert, let's remove this thing, check set, and get model. And let's just run this uh, unsupported invalid command. Ah, okay. Yeah, of course. This is a multi-line thing. <laughs> okay, so here, well, uh, it defines simply the function as drunk for any guest as false. Um, so right now, nobody's drunk. That's great. Uh, so this function kind of works. But now let's add this assertion here. So now we're saying that uh, there exists some x of type guest um, and then drunk x. So if this person is drunk, this implies that for all y in guest, y is also drunk, right? So now if we check satisfiability, um, Ah. Yeah, this is a bit uh this is a perfect model. Um but that's maybe not the model that we want, right? Uh it says nobody's drunk. So how does that work? That, that's that's um So how does this work that this uh, expression here is satisfied by making nobody drunk? So this this kind of fundamental law that there uh, exists some guest and that the guest is drunk implies that all the guests are drunk. How do we make this true? How do we satisfy this? Sorry? Yeah, so basically by saying that uh, nobody's drunk, how come this is satisfied by nobody being drunk? If we make everybody drunk, then of course it's satisfied, right? But why is it also satisfied by, so let's see if we assert that, uh, Like that's basically, well, of course, if we assert the conclusion here, uh, do we have enough parentheses? Could be. Now we should get a different model, right? Now everybody's drunk, right? But uh, oh. let's say some are drunk, some are not drunk. So we say 
there exists a guest who's drunk and there exists a guest probably like that now the function gets a little bit more complicated uh with an if then else so um <clears throat> It basically assigns some person, um, yeah, where it is false, some person where it's true, based on that person. So I guess here, if it's A, uh, then it's probably false and otherwise true. So A is not drunk, the rest of the people are drunk. How can this be? We said if some person is drunk, then everybody's drunk. So we, we just checked satisfiability, right? So let's, uh, so we check, uh, should we try to check validity? It's valid. So no matter how people are drunk or not, this statement is valid. Why? Is that your experience from the pub? No? Okay, so let's look again. Uh, at this one, it's a bit shorter than this one, but actually um, the quantification here is the problem. So it's, it's also called the drinker's paradox because it sounds paradox, right? But the mathematical mathematically, it is true. We proved that using our SMT solver, right? Um, well, we proved for up to five guests, we could prove it for more, right? Uh, but basically what happens here is it says uh, there exists some X. So let's say there is a person who is not drunk. We pick that person. That's our X. We plug that person in here. Drunk evaluates to false. False implies anything. We don't even have to evaluate this, right? So we know that for all Y, Drunk Y doesn't hold, right? Because there's just one person who's not drunk. So this is false, but false still implies false. We know that from propositional logic, right? So if we make this thing false, there's no more, uh, no further to look. We have satisfied this formula. Now let's say we can't make this one false. What's the reason we can't make this one false? What could be a possible reason we can't make this one false? Because there is no X where this is false. This means it's true for all x. So if this one is true for all x, then it's also, of course, true for all y, right? So this means that the function would be interpreted as everybody's drunk. So it would always return true. Then, of course, it doesn't matter which person we pick. They're drunk. This implies everybody's drunk. So this is the drinker's paradox. And that's because um, <clears throat> usually intuitively, we don't think about somebody picking this x as false, right? Because if we say um, there is someone in the pub such that if they are drunk, usually you think that, yeah, this person must be drunk. So you would evaluate this as true. And then this would follow that everyone else is drunk, right? But that's not the way it works. It says if they are drunk. So it could also be false. And then this doesn't say anything, right? So now I guess this better matches your intuition of the pub. Uh, so yeah, that's a very... Uh, like a logic riddle. So it's it's very popular uh, paradox. It's called the drinker's paradox, but actually it's not so paradox. It's just that if you're not very used to formal logic, uh, that stuff that is false actually can imply everything, uh, then that's why <clears throat> it sounds paradox. Okay. But this way we also learned quantifiers, right? Um, yeah. Now, what problems can we solve with SMT solvers? Now that we have all these tools, um, where's the? Hmm. Now we have oh, okay. here. Um, should we do this or just suggest? 
uh, let's just yeah suggest. So what are the the problems now we can solve with SMT solvers? We can even solve the stuff with the quantifiers, right? That's that's really really powerful. We can check validity, satisfiability. Um, we can get models. We can get interpretations for functions. So um, let's have a look. Can we still solve this one? Do you remember this? <laughs> can we still solve this? To check whether uh, that's a valid conclusion. So let's uh, try to encode this. Um, now, how do we, uh, can I put this on top? Let's check. Oh, well, we can try. <clears throat> so how do we start? We need some variables, right? So what are the variables that we might take? So we don't need any functions, right? We can just take constants. Um, so here we have, if the train arrives, arrives late, so train. How many do we need? Uh, we could have Taxi, uh, John Lage. Ah, and that's it. We only have these three variables, right? <clears throat> now, yeah, good. Well, we didn't now say anything, right? So um <clears throat> how do we encode the first one if the train arrives late and there are no taxis at the station then john is late for his meeting whenever we want to express some constraint we would write it as an assert and then we need well some connectives here right uh let's do the other ones first they are a bit shorter so we have three or four. Yeah, let's say four. Uh, so John is not late for his meeting. We can simply say not John late, right? Uh, the train did arrive late. Train late, and then I think we shouldn't put the double parenthesis. to this. Uh, the train did arrive late. OK. And then how do we do the first one? Uh, Uh, not taxi? Not taxi, yeah, not taxi. Okay, so we have, uh, John. we have an implies, yeah. uh, so this means the, if the train arrives late and there are no taxis, yes, that's what we expressed now, then this implies that John late, uh, and that probably is missing some parentheses. Okay, let's forget about this guy now. Just run this and check, is it syntactically fine? So now one possible scenario, we, we didn't check the, the last one, right? One possible scenario that satisfies this is uh, that there were taxis, that the train was late, and that John was not late. OK, kind of fits our intuition. So now how do we do the last one? Uh, therefore, there were taxis at the station. That's, uh, if, I, if I just do this, this means taxi, right? Um, OK, I can, I can check satisfiability of this. And of course, yeah, it is satisfiable because that 
model with, uh, oh no, we don't see it, the model with uh, taxi at the station, this was already the model that we had before, right? Of course, this previous model also satisfies the new assertion, but how do we check validity? <laughs> yeah, so we can now uh, simply negate the last assertion, right? Um, so we can see, is there any possibility that number one, number two, and number three hold, but number three does not hold. This is now what we're checking. So all these asserts, they're basically conjunctions. This assert, and that assert, and that assert, and this assert. Now we're asking, is there any possible model where these statements are true, but the last statement is false? And if there is no such model, then we know that the last statement must always be true based on the first three. Okay, so let's run this and unsat. We can't get a model because it's unsat. So yes, we, we showed validity. Great. So now um, that was easy, right? It's, it's even a bit easier than having this long semantic entailment uh, formula. Uh, so, but actually it's, it's the same. So it's the same as those formulas that we uh, created. They are just a bit more complicated writing the same thing. So we can reformulate that uh, using some uh, unfolding of implication and then removing parentheses and then applying De Morgan's law. So this is just, um, this was the semantic entailment. So, right, that's what we did with Limbool. We said, well, the first three, A, B, C, they should semantically entail the last one. Then we said, well, this uh, we can translate this to validity by checking whether this formula here with these nested implication is valid, right? And if it's unsat, then we know uh, that this semantic entailment is correct. So now, um, if we take this formula and negate it, then in this step, I just unfolded the implication. So the implication is the left side is negated and then an or. So basically this A implies something is not A or that other thing. Um, <clears throat> then I simplified a bit the parenthesis because now everything is just or, it all binds the same strength. So we can remove the parenthesis except for the ones that have the negation outside, right? And then how do we get a negation inside some uh, propositional logic formula? That's some uh, De Morgan's law. That's what it's called. That's some law that you might yeah, recall from, from logic. So basically you flip the negations and you change all the ors to ends. Uh, it, it also works in both uh, directions. So, and then this thing here, that's exactly what we had in SMT. We had assert A, assert B, assert C, and assert not D. So we were actually checking exactly the same thing. Um, and we should of course check that we are checking the same thing. That's why I added this slide that shows us that this is what we previously did and we can simplify it to what we did right now, right? Okay. Uh, and from now on, when we want to check this kind of validity, we have those constraints as assertions on the left side and then uh, the semantic entailment. If we want to check this, we have those as normal assertions on the left side, and then we have D as the uh, negated assertion for the right side. And if it's unsat, we know that we had the semantic entailment. So that's like, yeah, some kind of pattern that we can use from now on to do semantic entailment checking with SMT solvers. Okay. Um, can we solve this thing now? <laughs> the Doc cat mouse puzzle. So how would we solve this now? Um, what are the what are the um, variables that we need? So we always need to kind of start with variables, right? So Doc cat mouse. So declare const doc int oh.
and we have the cat mouse and then uh, we have these things to say that well dog greater or equal to one um, and these are all now assertions right so this would be a search greater equal dog one uh, yeah and then of course this thing we also have for cat and we also have this for mouse uh, should we check sat and get model then uh, we're missing some no ah, this was the only correct one uh. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, of course, uh, if we select one for everyone, then it's greater than one. But now let's say, uh, well, we want to buy a uh, hundred, right? So how do we may, how do we do that? Let's do the easy thing first, the hundred, let's do the hundred first. <laughs> right doesn't matter which side of the equals we, we put it so let's do the 100 here first and then uh so that's actually a very nice thing that the plus you can use it with many parameters and it's the sum of everything. So in theory, if, if this was really um, always just true, then we would have to write it like uh, this, right? We would have to nest the addition of, I don't know, cat and mouse and then do the plus doc, right? Uh, um, but plus is, is one of those, uh, yeah, very nice ones where uh, it's supported that you can use this shorthand. So that's some syntactic sugar uh, that they implemented, and this might come in very handy later on as well. Okay, so yeah, that's 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 the more complicated one. And then here we actually um, have a last one. Okay, so we need to spend, we can spend up to, uh, what was that? Uh, And now we need to have, we need to say what actually does equal this. Uh, so it's again a sum, right? So let's do a plus again. And then, yeah, so let's look at the prices. So the doc was uh, uh, 1500, oh, yeah, we want multiplication. Doc, how much was a cat? 100. Twenty-five mouse. Yeah, and now is that mm, that's all right? Um, we're done. So it says we need to buy three dogs, forty-one cats, and then we can buy uh, fifty-six mice. So we can easily check that all of them are greater than one, right? We bought one of each. Uh, do they add up to hundred? Yep, they do. Uh, do they cost? Are the cost fine? We just trust this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. We we could solve this as well. Um, can we solve this one? Yeah, right. Uh, what would this be? We have uh, some variables, right? What are the variables? Well, there's some stuff that is recurring, right? This thing needs to be the same as that thing. If you want to name them X, that's maybe confusing. So let's name them, I don't know, rain. This is rainbow. Maybe this is double rainbow, right? So, uh, yeah. And then what are the assertions that we have? 
So yeah, we would basically have that this thing is equal to 12, this thing is equal to four. So that's basically each line here is one assertion. What do we do with this question mark? That's the one we're interested in, right? So what do we need to define for that? Uh, we can define some variable at the start. Yes, and then we, we can write SR x. Yeah, so we'll the for this one, we will basically define some special variable, for example, the variable solution. And then uh, here we will assert, the last assert will say solution equals this thing, right? And then uh, we get a solution for that as well. Uh, so the rainbow would be seven, uh, solution would be minus two, lightning would be six, rain would be four, uh, double rainbow would be 12, and then the division would always return two. <laughs> um, that's probably because we only have this one division, right? So that's why this division function is very simple and always returns a constant. But yeah, this would be our solution to this kind of problem. And this one? <laughs> Can we also solve this? Well, time is up now. Uh, it's 10.45, so I think we will have to move this to Friday. Um, but yeah, basically now we, we were well equipped for all of these kind of uh, puzzles that we motivated with that we can't really easily solve with the subsol, right? Uh, and, and this thing here, this, this final thing, um, we will see how to do that. You probably have to use quantifiers again, like in, uh, like in this uh, quantification example. Um, so this one is like the prototype because here we have the data type guest. You can imagine that that's the people living at the mansion, the butler and Agatha. Okay, great. So see you on Friday.